1943, when noted scientists left the outside world and came to Los Alamos to create an atom bomb, they didn't know the exact approach they would take or even what materials they would use. The flash was later calculated to be brighter than a thousand suns. Miles away, a young girl, blind from birth, saw the flash. Men at the site felt the heat of a desert sun. Then came the shock wave. Two GIs at the command center stood up in their excitement at seeing the boiling cloud and were knocked to the ground. The roar followed, a cascading thunderclap that rolled and boomed out across the desert. Since the first atomic bombs were built here at Los Alamos, the world has learned more and more about atomic power. Slowly, we on this planet have begun to understand the deadly legacy of smashing the atom. Rising background radiation, mutation, cancer, and the most haunting of all, nuclear waste. And we find ourselves faced with nuclear waste from 40 years of atomic brinksmanship, and that waste will emit deadly radioactivity for hundreds of thousands of years. 100,000 tons of radioactive plutonium waste would decay to 50,000 tons of radioactivity within the mass in 27,000 years. 50,000 tons would decay to 25,000 tons in 54,000 years, and so on. At the end of 250,000 years, 97.62 tons of radioactivity would remain within the 100,000 ton mass. The biggest battle in the nuclear arena is now being waged in Carlsbad, New Mexico at the proposed WIP site, WIP, Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. This is where the U.S. government plans to bury our low-level nuclear waste underground in giant salt caverns. The waste to be stored at WIP is the so-called low-level waste, plutonium soiled clothing and tools. Not the high-level spent fuel rods of uranium-239 emitting gamma rays so deadly it is said that a motorcyclist passing an exposed control rod at 60 miles an hour would die in minutes from the resulting radiation. Across America at nuclear reactor sites, spent fuel rods are being presently stored underwater in large cement cooling ponds, waiting for transport to the yet undesignated high-level waste disposal site. That battle is being fought in Nevada at Yucca Mountain, where Nevada's Governor Cecil Andrus was taken to court by the federal government because of Nevada's resistance to having the high-level waste site located in the state. What has come to pass because of Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and the growing evidence of genetic mutation, cancer, leukemia, resulting from exposure to radiation and radioactive fallout is that nobody wants nuclear waste in their backyard. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, residents have been fighting the transport of nuclear waste through their town to the WIP site for 10 years. They know that once the trucks of nuclear waste start rolling, there will be one arriving at WIP every 90 seconds for the next 30 years. That's how much radioactive waste has piled up. A quietly desperate hint of resignation can be sensed now from some people beginning to surrender to the possibility that the planet has become irreversibly enslaved to the nuclear legacy. However, in 1981, the results of the research of one of the world's most eminent nuclear physicists caught the attention of the world press. Dr. Rod Haroy, former director of the University of Brussels Nuclear Physics Laboratory and the Penn State Nuclear Physics Laboratory, had made the discovery of a process whereby unstable elements of nuclear waste could be transformed and stabilized. The Roy process for the neutralization and elimination of nuclear waste. Dr. Roy was teaching nuclear physics as Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona in 1981 when the Phoenix Sun broke the story. Last summer, EIS interviewed Dr. Roy at his home in Phoenix. I first asked Dr. Roy to give us a brief history of his life and his work. Dr. Radha Roy. I was born in Calcutta in India, and I started to read and write from a very early age, at the age of two. I knew how to read and write. By the age of 12, I finished practically world literature, Russian, German, French, Italian, of course in translated languages. And uh, then from the age of 14, I started to work on nuclear theory. This continued until I was in my mid-teen. And uh, later on, on the basis of my research, I was invited to go to London to do research, mostly, and some teaching. 
and uh, I, I got my doctorate degree in the University of London in 1946. Of course, I joined London when the war was still going on and the German, German bombers were coming every night and sometimes during the day. It was 1940, beginning of 43. I stayed in London about seven years doing research, publishing papers and advising students. Then University of Brussels, Belgium, they wanted to build up their nuclear physics laboratory. So I accepted this position in Brussels. And <laughs> the strange part is I remember that I, although I knew how to speak Russian and German and some English, I didn't know how to speak French. They gave me three months. Of course, I did learn French in three months and started to give my lectures. I built up their nuclear physics laboratory. Quite a few students joined me to do their doctorate degree. I was in the University of Brussels for eight years building their program and I was also frequently invited to give lectures in various European universities, including Sorbonne, University of Paris. I remember very well Professor Frédéric Joliot and Madame Irene Joliot-Curie. Madame Irene Joliot-Curie is the daughter of Pierre and Madame Curie. He used to invite me and I used to be their house guest. I'm very honored that they showed me this courtesy and we became great friends. I knew all the European scientists, for example, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Heitler, and uh, many Italian scientists, including some Danish scientists, and I still, most of them have passed away. But after, anyhow, after eight years in Brussels University, Pens Pennsylvania State University wanted to build their nuclear physics program. So when they offered me a position there as a director, so I joined Penn State. Before me, there was no nuclear physics program at Penn State. It became a very well-organized, very successful laboratory, some over 150 people, including faculty members and students and staff. Really, the work in this laboratory, I had to design new building, raise funds from the Atomic Energy Commission, substantial funds to carry on research program and uh, also buy equipment and whatnot. So the, I also remember we used to have Russian visitors to the National Academy of Sciences as invited guests. And, uh, in one occasion, President Eisenhower visited the nuclear physics lab. I was at 